Hi everyone and welcome back. In today's lecture, we'll be covering two chapters, chapter 7 on mental illness and crime and chapter 8 on psychopathy. In the first part of this lecture, we will focus on mental illness and its relationship to criminal behaviours. In this part of the lecture, we will be defining mental illness from a legal perspective and examining its relationship with crime. We will also be looking at the concept of criminal responsibility and how having a psychological disorder may serve as a defence against crime. Finally, we will quickly look at how mental illness is dealt with during incarceration. In Singapore, the Mental Health Care and Treatment Act was passed in 2008 to regulate the involuntary detention of a person in a psychiatric institution for the treatment of a mental disorder. Um, this act was passed in the interest of health and safety of the person or the persons around him. The act provides for the admission, detention, care and treatment of mentally disordered persons in designated psychiatric institutions. These may include IMH, which is the Institute of Mental Health and specific prisons in, prison institutions. The term mental illness is often confused with the term mental retardation. They are actually quite different. Mental illness is a disorder of the mind that includes clinically significant conditions that are characterized by alterations in thought patterns, mood or behaviors. It is often associated with personal distress and impaired functioning. As a result, it interferes with an individual's ability to cope with daily activities. It may also result in behaviours that differ from what is considered to be normal conduct. In the context of understanding criminal behaviours, it can be used interchangeably with the term mental disorder. Mental retardation, on the other hand, is a, development of an in, is a developmental or intellectual disability often characterised by cognitive deficiencies. So as you can see, these two terms are quite different. Um, and you shouldn't be confused when you're reading the chapter or listening to the rest of this lecture. Issue of crime and violence Introducing violence amongst people with mental disorder. Now, within the domain of public media, it's a topic that has been discussed for a very long time. This is evident in the amount of TV shows and movies that center around people who are mentally ill and their involvement in crime. Unfortunately, the media disproportionately portrays the people who are highly involved in the act. However, however, in real life, brutal, violent, and apparently senseless crimes are not usually committed by people who are mentally ill. In fact, research and statistics show just the opposite. That is, they are more likely to be victims of crime if they are more vulnerable than they are to be perpetrated themselves as the majority of people with mental illness are not violent. However, we must acknowledge that a small proportion of are more likely to be engaged in violent crimes um, that are more severe in nature, perhaps due to their inability to self-regulate and successfully control their emotions. In summary, I would like to really stress again that the percentage of people with mental disorders is really small, and therefore, in relation to the general population, only a small proportion of crimes are committed by them. Um, among the population of people who are mentally ill or who have mental disorders, we know that there are certain subgroups who are more likely to be at risk of committing violent crimes. And these are people who are homeless, those who are abused, and those who do not regularly 
In the next two slides, we'll look at four The first, the finger is the most closely associated with mind, and is what a lay person would describe as a behavior. Males would be ready and display antisocial behavior. We also know that the proportion of violent crimes in the world is going to be more. When people commit violent crimes, the level of violence involved may be higher than the so called normal violent offender. Excessive violence is the most common among offenders with hallucinations and delusions, and not just one or the other. Delusional disorders, on the other hand, which is also known as paranoid. Um, versus an alien is protected from the state. These delusions may include persons who we believe to have been spied on, cheated, conspired, and conspired against. They may result in feelings of anger and resentment, which in turn may result in violent behaviors. The role of depression in the development of human behavior has also been studied for a long time. Data suggests that. For example, those suffering from major disorder often don't care what happens to them, which may increase the likelihood of them gravitating towards delinquency. On the other hand, it could be a um, relationship in the opposite direction, where delinquent behavior will adversely lead to depression. Depression also likely plays a significant role in things like mass murders, school shootings, but for them, Violence. Finally, antisocial personality disorder, um, uh, another mental disorder that has been associated with crimes. First, those with ASD are more likely to violate the rights of others without feeling any guilt. We know that ASD occurs more frequently in males than females, and about three percent of women males. 1% of women males suffer Research suggests that it is a common diagnosis of female dependents and dependents, and it is still frequently used in the diagnosis of criminal courts as well as in the correction setting. Um, in this section, we will look at some of the factors that determine whether somebody is considered to be criminally responsible for his or her actions in the eyes of the law. Um, previously, we discussed different psychiatric diagnoses that are important or that are related to crime or human behavior. These diagnoses are important when the court needs to make a decision on whether defendants are competent to set the trial or not. Some people with crime who have committed crimes may be considered both intellectually or psychologically impaired. Even if they were to stand trial, they will only be present physically but not mentally. Therefore, this group of people are considered to be incompetent to stand trial. Someone is only considered to be competent to stand trial if they have the sufficient present ability to consult with their lawyers with a reasonable degree of understanding of their rights, as well as support the proceeding. Incompetence to stand trial here does not just refer to the mental or emotional state, but could also refer to a lack of understanding of the court proceedings, and the defendant may not have the capability to understand what is going on or the court processes. Now, this is sometimes a problem that's related to juvenile. Competency is also an important issue when dealing with 
those who are developmentally disabled, for example, those who are mentally retarded. Therefore, um, when judging whether somebody is competent to stand trial or has adjudicative competence, there are three things that, um, no, sorry, they're not three things. There's a, um, the question that um, the court would ask is what was the defendant's state of mind or what is the defendant's state of mind at the present time or at the time of the pre-trial proceedings or trial itself? Now, the term competency to, trial, to stand trial actually covers two different concepts. First, is whether they have adjudicative competence, which is, are they competent enough cognitively or intellectually to proceed with the trial with an understanding of the purpose of the proceedings? And are they able to make um, decisions? That is, do they have decisional competence? That is, the ability to understand the significance of the decisions that they're going to make. Secondly, they also consider whether somebody um, is able to understand the charges that is brought against him or her and able to consult with his or her attorney in a rational manner. A defendant may also be found not guilty by reason of the And if a defendant does plead not guilty by reason of the insanity, the question the court will ask is not so much what is the defendant's present state of mind, but what was the defendant's state of mind at the time that the offence was committed. A criminal defendant who claims not guilty by reason of the insanity or MGRI asserts but ask the court to find him not culpable because of his mental state at the time that the offence was committed. Now, this is a legal term, it is not a pathological term, as it refers to the person's state of mind when the offence was committed. The person's state of mind at that time, however, has to be um, judged or evaluated by a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Now, this term differs from the term incompetency to stand trial. Um, that is, it looks at whether the individual was mentally disordered at the time of an offence and whether his or her criminal responsibility is questionable. One famous case of um, a defendant who claims MGRI is the case of Andre Ye, a 31 year old mother who drowned her four children aged between six months to seven years old in a bathtub. Andrea had a history of mental disorder and had attempted suicide twice. She also claimed to have a severe case of postpartum psychosis and she believed that she was possessed by Satan and that her kids would burn in hell because she was involved and because they were associated with her. She believed that to save them they had to die now so that they would go to heaven. In the first uh, trial, she was found guilty. Um, they later on had a retrial because of the incompetency in trial proceedings, and during the retrial, she was found not guilty for reasons of insanity, and she's still hospitalized till today. You can click on this link here um, to watch her story and find out more. Over time, there have been some unique differences that have been used that, um, by defendants that are linked to mental disorders. The first one is post-traumatic stress disorder. According to the DSM-5, PTSD is the development of characteristics symptoms following exposure to extreme trauma. It may involve personal experience of an event that involves um, that involves death. This event may be actual or threatened death. PTSD is a diagnosis that falls under the category of anxiety disorder and has been used to support the claims of NGRI in both violent and non-violent cases. The primary legal argument is that the defendant was in a PTSD disorder at the time of the act. 
which refers to significance for the individual person's death, meaning that the person's health and his symptoms are found in it, and does not therefore remember what he or he has experienced or even his experiences in the Next, on the syndrome of death, a better conversation is an example of uh, a case that can be considered the diagnosis of PTSD. Better woman syndrome happens when a woman claims a post that she suffered from her spouse or partner was so extensive and brutal that a dissociated state was brought about by the disorder and she killed the abuser during this disassociated state. In real life, many of the defendants in these situations also use self defense to support their case. Although there has been evidence that an individual suffering from PTSD um, is accurate or is an accurate diagnosis, and it has been extended to adults, however, it rarely involves criminal violence or a total lack of responsibility of crime, but it may result in a um, charge of diminished responsibility and therefore lack of Um, one example of a man that has claimed PTSD is the case of Robert Dale, a former U.S. Army soldier who murdered 60 Afghan civilians in Afghanistan on March 11, 2012. Um, this event is known as the Kandahar Massacre. In order to avoid the death penalty, Dale pleaded guilty to 16 counts of murder and 6 counts of assault on a man that he was um, about a year and a half after the incident, he was sentenced to life in prison with parole. U.S. Army investigators said that Dale was the only person responsible for the shooting and the death was a result of two simple attacks. Investigators said that Dale returned to the camp after the first attack and left the camp an hour later in the midst of the second attack. A senior military official said that Dale had been sleeping after the first flood of sleeping in the night of the shootings, which violates the military combat rules. He was asked, what was your reason for killing them? He said he had asked himself the same question for the last time. He also said there's no good reason in the world for why the result of the attack. He maintains that he knew the cause of the attack was the fire, and he attested that the evidence was against his dad. He also said that he took his steroid and slowly, uh, solely so that he could feel muscle and blame the steroid for increasing his irritability and the or lack of energy. Um, previously, previous, previous to this incident, Bales had no history of no criminal record or history of mental disorder, but in his defense, he claimed that he saw his friend's leg being blown off the day before the killings, and that actually affected him a lot, and that was one of the reasons why he was drinking alcohol in the camp. Um, he used PTSD as a defense, um, however, his claim was dismissed in court. Another disorder that is often used um, or is tried, that is often tr defendants often try to use in court um, is the Dissociative Identity Disorder, DS or DID. The essential feature of DID is the existence within the person of two or more distinct personalities or personality states that recurrently control behaviour. Each personality may be aware of some or all other personalities within the individual in varying degrees. Um, the defendant, when using this disorder as a justification for his behaviour in court, usually claims that the crime was committed when another person was in control. The validity of DID is questioned by both mental health and legal professionals. Thus, it's not surprising that it isn't usually a very successful defence. Case of uh, 
Even while committing the murder, he only actually applied for the law to the law to the department. And had he been taken the federal bribe to the police officer while they were searching for the suspect strangler? Despite evidence against him, A third unique um, defense that's used is actually if you hear we to the events or a series of events that one life some researchers have identified involved in the pathological inability to remember a specific episode in the past. Um, this may be caused by a shock in the situation of the patient. This defense is commonly cited by violence. However, the courts are not towards this issue. They hold the person is capable of using substances to inflict In general, the courts are not receptive to admission of valid conviction in either the ACRI or Justice Agents to stand trial defenses. The only exception is in cases of brain injury and severe infection established between injury and Um, prisoners who have been diagnosed with mental disorders are treated quite differently within the prison setting. Excuse me. Um, upon entering prison, they are assessed by a multidisciplinary treatment team consists of psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, social workers, and even rehabilitation therapists. The multidisciplinary team runs a diagnostic evaluation. Um, to assess their physical and mental state, a psychological evaluation to assess or re-diagnose other mental or diagnose if them for the mental disorder that they came in for and to assess them for other mental disorders. We also do a suicide assessment to assess the individual's um, risk of committing suicide while in prison. A risk assessment in terms of his malleability to change. Um, often they may also conduct a psychosocial assessment to assess what other forms of support the individual may need. And finally, rehabilitation assessment in terms of what kind of therapy should be prioritized. Um, in terms of the mental state, we know that females usually have a higher rate of mental illness than male inmates. Um, the two mental illnesses or mental disorders that are most likely to be associated with them are major depression and psychotic disorders. For some women, being in prison increases um, or exacerbates the mental illness, and we know that for some of them, it increases the frequency of self harm up to 10 times more. We also know that the suicide rate for women in prison is much higher than it is in the world population. 
Within the prison setting, prisoners are um, mental disorders who treated through from uh, are treated pharmacologically. For example, with the use of antipsychotic or antidepressant drugs. Also, they can also have psychological um, treatment or in the form of CBT, family therapy, or art, drama, or even music therapies, depending on what the psychologist prescribes. And finally, many also go through social or occupational therapy in the form of religious counseling, skills training to equip them with skills required to work upon release, or academic training, as many of them do not have much academic training before they enter the prison system. For example, in Singapore, in the Singapore prisons, about 80% of prisoners have secondary two or below education only. In this next section of the lecture, we will actually be looking at criminal psychopathy. Quickly, we will be looking at the definition of what or who is a psychopath, some measures used to, make, used to assess psychopathy. We will also be looking at a specific type of psychopath, that is the juvenile psychopath. And in the last two sections, we will be looking at what are some factors that contribute towards making somebody a psychopath and some of the treatment options available for them. Psychopathy is among the most difficult disorders in the world. The psychopath can afford to never and even hide. However, underneath his charm, he or she often lacks conscience and empathy, making him manipulative, volatile, and often, but not always, a criminal. The psychopath is an object of popular fascination and clinical anger. Adult psychopathy is largely impervious to treatment. The programs are in place to try to treat callous and unemotional youth in the hopes of preventing them from maturing into adult psychopaths. Anecdotally, psychopaths have been recognized for centuries and have appeared universally. We know that they are not limited to any single culture, as evidence of psychopathy has been found in literary historical, political, and even religious texts. Although they may appear to be normal, um, some think of them as interspecies predators who use vulnerable victims to their own benefit. Um, some psychologists also believe that psychopathy is not actually a mental disorder, but a cheating lifestyle that has evolved, and that, is, that it, it is in fact adaptive and facilitative in many environments. Psychopaths are often high-density and versatile offenders who commit a wide range of crimes. Um, and when violence is involved, it is usually more predatory, callous or calculated in the sense that it is carefully planned. And uh, the psychopath often doesn't think very much for the feelings or emotions of the victim. And it is also usually motivated by readily identifiable goals. Robert Hare, a leading researcher of psychopaths, wrote three categories of psychopaths. He suggests the primary psychopath is two psychopaths. This group of people is identifiable, emotional, cognitive, and biological. Secondly, psychopaths on the other hand, it is social or violent acts because of severe illness. They are sometimes referred to as acting out neurotics and They may be more emotionally unstable and impulsive than primary psychopaths. Could explain why they are more aggressive and violent. They are also more likely to have some of the parents and parents and parents children. The third group, this social psychopath are male superior aggressive, usually display an extreme behavior that they have learned from their subculture, for example, the gangs in their family. Um, the, he claims that, or he proposes that they are not so psychopath as the psychopath behavior is actually not instinctive but instead learned from their family. 
And this quote from Hare, um, if you actually describe a uh, psychopath scored high on his uh, what this individual told him that while walking to a party, he decided to buy a case of beer. But he realized that he had left his wallet at home, and home was six to seven blocks away. Not wanting to walk back, he picked up a heavy piece of wood and walked and robbed the nearest gas station, seriously injuring the attendant. Now, it may sound very extreme. It is extreme. Um, but in this case, this individual was able to do so because he walked around with no feelings of guilt or conscience. His only um, goal or motivation was to satisfy his own needs, and therefore he could walk around doing whatever he wished to do. As mentioned earlier, most Um, we know that psychopaths are egocentric, egocentric in the sense that they care maybe about themselves and their own needs. They appear to be superficially charming, which makes it easy for them to charm or to lie and charm their victims. They often lack empathy or feelings for another person, focusing only on their needs instead. As a result, they often appear to be, or they often are, pathological liars or cheaters and use instrumental aggression in the sense that aggression is used as a means to achieve their own goals. They're usually also impulsive and are sensation seekers. Um, they have an active interest in dangerous sports and are likely to tune out dangerous stimuli as they're less sensitive to anxiety and danger. One reason for this could be that research has shown that their heart um, do not beat faster than normal when anticipating stress, which is something that most of us experience. Their skin conduction levels are actually lower than control in response to aggressive stimuli. Um, some or a lot of them also display semantic aphasia, where they may express regret. That's only at a superficial level because they're lying, because they don't really feel any remorse. Um, it is they are very manipulative to meet their own goals but have no feelings of true remorse. They may also have response modulation effect where they are unable to use contextual cues to modulate their behavior and only focus on the reward that they want. Many are also emotionally to experience certain physical emotions like pro-social behaviors or inhibit deviance. Most of them have above average intelligence, uh, but they are however, interestingly, incapable of learning how to avoid failure and dangerous situations over time. We know that most psychopaths have no history of serious antisocial behaviors um, and that the term will be used for psychopaths who want to justify their brains than in any These individuals tend to be more dominant, manipulative, impulsive, and lifestyle. In today's society, we actually Air estimates about 5% of the meet the criteria of the social personality disorder, but of this number, only 15 to 25% of the people This number is still higher than what is out there in the world, which is still the same population as the population. We know that in terms of recidivism, Psychopaths are two times more likely than the one to make and three to five times more likely to recidivate violently. Criminal psychopaths are also responsible for a disproportionate amount of crime in society, 
especially those that involve sexual offences or sexual homicide. The crimes are also usually more brutally violent and sadistic, where um, they may practice or use violence as a form of revenge or retribution. Interestingly, however, their victims are strangers, but very often the stranger may look like somebody that they want to take revenge or seek retribution from. Therefore, there is a difference between the psychopath um, often feels that he's invulnerable, he's uh, stronger than other people, and other people are inferior or weaker compared to him. A reactive offender, on the other hand, may view himself as being more vulnerable, and he doesn't view others as being weaker than him, but instead views others as being hostile or antagonistic towards him. A psychopath usually manipulates and uses violence to get what he wants, whereas a reactive offender is more likely to become an offender due to poor problem-solving techniques, his inability to manipulate the environment, and may use violence as a defense mechanism. Um, one interesting psychopath is the case of John Wayne Gacy, who murdered 32 people over a period of time. However, he was not a suspect in most of these cases because he was seen as a pillar of the community. He was a respected professor and was also named the Junior Chamber of Commerce in the year. He regularly volunteered as Pogo the Clown in the Tuesday Stadium of the um, many didn't believe that he was actually a murderer who murdered 32 people. Another interesting case is the case of Tian um, um, And what makes her interesting is that she was a very few students who were Female psychopaths have certain characteristics that differentiate them from male psychopaths, where they have higher levels of callousness, lower levels of empathy. However, they are usually less violent and aggressive, and um, usually use social influences to help them be good. They are also less likely to recidivate than male psychopaths. Now, in the case of this lady, Leonardo, um, she actually had or she was actually pregnant 17 times she was married. But she lost three of them due to miscarriage. Seven died in their room. Therefore, she had four little children and she was very, very protective. She was always afraid that they would be taken away from her or they would die in some way. And her fears were fueled by a warning from the school from the first sister that told her that she would marry and have children, but that all her children. In 1939, he heard that her eldest son was born later in life in preparation for World War II. Now, he was her favorite child and was determined to be kept in at all costs. Um, she somehow came to the conclusion that his safety required him to sacrifice So she found her victims in three middle aged women who were her neighbors. Um, the first victim, Betty, came to visit her earlier in the and when she came to visit her, Leonardo opened her glass of water. She then killed her with an egg and left the body to her. She then cut Seti's body with a knife part, gathering the blood in her face. And in her official statement, she said, I threw the pieces into a pot. I added seven kilos of pasta to the water. This third bottle of this part is dissolved. As for the blood left in the basin, I waited till it had been deleted. I dried it in the air, but I found it in this flour sugar. It burns a bit of margarine, kneading all the ingredients together. I get lots of crunchy tea cakes. Tell the two ladies what is it. The other two ladies suffered similar things. However, she was caught when her sister-in-law grew suspicious of the friends they were sharing, especially after they had visited her mother. 
is a local police and the question the mother confessed to the crime. As mentioned earlier, not all um Anthony's case is the case of Anthony and he is known as a great as he had a very different resume of different things that he had done and there's a series of people and I did about um and the system of other than Who always wanted to do something and succeeded in making more rough to somebody else's. Perhaps his most impressive impersonation came during the Korean War, where he impersonated a doctor in the Royal Navy. When several Korean combat casualties were brought on board, he was responsible for saving their lives. Um, he was reported to have a problem with memory and Years ago, he quickly studied a medical text and then he saved the life of every single man. Every single man. Um, his acts of bravery and um, spread led to his discovery because all the media attention he got at the time prevented him from continuing his fraudulent, fraudulent lifestyle. And it is a little bit difficult to do when everybody knows what you look like. Dr. Hare um, developed the psychopathy checklist, PCL, and the psychopathy checklist revised, PCLR. It assesses the different dimensions of psychopathy and was first developed to identify male psychopaths in the prison, forensic or psychiatric setting. He focuses mainly on antisocial behaviours and not so much criminal behaviours. And what it does do is that it assesses affective, interpersonal, behavioural and social deviant facets of psychopathy. As psychopaths are known to not always tell the truth, um, it uses information from various sources including self-reports, behavioural observations, um, feedback from parents, family and friends as well. Hypothesize that there are four core factors interpersonal, having an impulsive lifestyle, lack of affection, as well as antisocial. This four factors. In this next section, we'll be looking at the highlight who committed triple homicide. Um, he was born in 1989 and was a Mexican New Mexico teenager who confessed to killing his father, stepmother, and stepsister. On July 4, 2004, after enduring years of abuse from his father, he stabbed when his father slapped him across the face for not cleaning the hostels fast enough. According to his defense team, prior to the murder, Cody had been abused. He had been burnt with a welding rod and instructed by his father to have sex with his sister. Cody told sheriff deputies that he had refused and ran off the property but did return later. The next day, upon being slapped, Cody took a gun from his stepsister's bag and loaded it. He went inside the house where his father was reading a book and where, sorry, where his sister was reading a book and shot her twice in the head. He confessed that he shot her a second time to make sure that he got the job done. 
Upon hearing the shots, his father ran inside when he, Cody also shot him to death. Next, he pointed his weapon towards his mother who was standing behind his father, shooting her in the head for fear that she would be the one to turn him in. He dragged the bodies out of the house and loaded them into a bucket. Since he planned the order of killings so that he would not get caught, the prosecution contends that the actions would prove that he was aware of the fact that murdering his family was a crime. He shot his sister first to stop her from calling 911. Various witnesses, however, testified that his father was indeed abusive and cruel to him. He frequently punched or slapped him and gave him various chores around the ranch that had to be done really quickly. Cody admitted that he attempted to bury his three family members in a nearby plot of land, but after not being able to break ground, opted to bury them in a shallow grave in a manure pile. After the murders, Cody changed his clothes and drove his father's truck to the store for a can of Sprite. He then drove to a friend's house and stayed there until his arrest. He was found guilty of various degrees of homicide and was subsequently sentenced as a juvenile to be detained until he was 21 years old with the possibility of parole. The most commonly used measure to measure juvenile psychopathy is the Psychopathy Checklist Youth Version, which is a 20-item rating scale ad adapted from the adult PCLR. There are, however, some problems associated with it. That is, firstly, juvenile psychopaths, like adult psychopaths, are unlikely to tell the truth. Um, it is also a time-consuming measure to administer and it requires extensive training. Research has also suggested that it is more reliable in identifying psychopathy in males than it is in females. There are some ethical concerns involved in labelling a child a juvenile psychopath because regardless of the characteristics or behaviour of an individual, labelling a young child as a psychopath or even as being pre-psychopathic is highly controversial. Psychopathy, as we know, has no known effective treatments and the diagnosis does create long-term social stigma. Therefore, you can't rightfully label a child a psychopath until adulthood because he or she has not had the full chance to emotionally, socially and morally develop. Now, the period of adolescence is a period where there are significant changes in the individual's personality. Therefore, personality disorders such as psychopathy should ideally not be diagnosed at such a young age as personality has yet to stabilise. Secondly, what we consider to be features of adult psychopathy, things like being self-absorbed, impulsive and sensation-seeking, could actually be normal behaviours for somebody during their adolescence. Finally, labelling somebody as a psychopath may also lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy. The next question to ask is whether psychopaths are born or made. Um, if you click on the link here, you will be able to listen to what Tommy Lin, a convicted psychopath, has to say about his life and the crimes that he has committed. As with other criminal behaviours or psychological disorders, we can look at the family environment, the larger environment the person grows up in, genetic factors and personal and individual factors to help explain the development of psychopathy. We know that in terms of the family environment, um, research has suggested that the lack of affection and severe parental rejection may be the primary causes of psychopathic behaviours. Um, inconsistencies in discipline or having no discipline at all, um, having suffered from physical abuse and harsh disciplinary styles may also contribute to the development of psychopathic tendencies. Um, we know that in terms of genetic factors, psychopaths are likely to have hemispherical asymmetry, 
um, amygdalic dysfunction in the sense that amygdala may not function as well as that of other people, making it more difficult for them to regulate um, emotions. And as discussed earlier in this lecture, also differences in how their autonomic nervous system functions. In terms of the larger environment, research has shown that environmental factors such as marital problems and substance abuse are linked to the development of antisocial personality disorders and the display of psychopathic tendencies. Um, we know that those who grow up in environments with a higher level of violence and substance abuse are also more likely to develop these tendencies. Many psychopaths also had negative school experiences, either in terms of academic failure, um, rejection from their peers, as well as labeling, labeling from teachers. Some of these factors may have contributed to the lack of pro-social tendencies or to their lack of pro-social tendencies. Um, however, we cannot say that these factors cause the development of antisocial behaviours. It could also be the other way around, in the sense that um, a child who displays antisocial behaviours from a young age may be difficult to deal with, and therefore the environment may react to these tendencies that the child already displays. Um, this, in turn, may fuel the development of full-blown antisocial behaviours. Therefore, the relationship between the development of antisocial behaviours or psychopathic tendencies may not be the environment causing the behaviour, but it could also be a result of the interaction between the individual and the environment. Now, even though only a small proportion of our environment or population makes up psychopaths, it's important that we understand this um, disorder um, and how we can treat it. It is crucial for not just their safety but for ours as well. Unfortunately, although psychopathy has been around for many years, there, are, there is little empirical study on it. Um, currently, there's no known treatment for adult psychopathy, and most adult psychopaths are not responsive to treatment. However, as mentioned earlier, there are some treatment options or treatments available for younger psychopaths or juvenile psychopaths targeting their callous or unemotional behaviours. Um, one reason why treatment of psychopaths has been difficult is because many psychopaths have self-inflated images and they're generally happy with themselves. They see no reason to change. This results in low motivation to do well in therapy and early drop-out rates. Mm, they are also manipulative and they can pick up on a variety of reasons to justify their behaviours. Um, most of the research has also been done on male psychopaths. Therefore, there is not as much research done on female psychopaths and treatment options for female psychopaths are even more limited. Program evaluation is also difficult because of the earlier psychopaths may not to manipulate the system. Now, this brings us to the end of today's lecture. Um, there are some links for further reading here if you're interested in finding out more about psychopaths. Thank you.